Good afternoon and welcome to our first seminar of 2023. It is my pleasure to introduce Mike Whitaker, the University of Glasgow, and he will talk about self-similarity of substitution tiling semigroups. Ed, okay. maybe just hit got it on your screen as well. Uh, yeah, got it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I mean, it's really funny the what things you start to care about uh, when you're traveling. So I, I tried the water here and it tasted delicious and that uh, made me very happy. <laughs> it's uh, anyway, sorry. Uh, well, the, yeah, yeah, the beer is also good. I've also, I've tried that also. Uh, um, anyway, so uh, thank you for, again for having me. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not gonna talk too much about CSER algebras here. I'm gonna talk about uh, some other work on semi-groups and I'll make some connections with CSER algebras while I go, but uh, it's uh, it's really sort of the pre CSER algebra viewpoint at the moment, um, and uh, there's more work to be done. And uh, I'm happy to discuss that uh, at any point. But the idea here is to really look at uh, well, okay, so tiling the self similar groups or uh, semi groups, right? So here's my plan that comes up. Oh. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, there we go. Now, we'll, oh yeah, now it moves. Okay, oh yeah, and this is joint work with Jamie Walton, but I guess you can read, so thank you. Uh, okay, so here's my plan. So I'm gonna start with tilings and our properties, and just this is just gonna be a sort of crash course in uh, tiling theory and what I care about, about it. Uh, and then I, I added this section two to sort of motivate uh, these self-similar semi-groups by first talking about self-similar groups, and then I can just uh, scan over the definitions because the only real difference is that with semigroups you have to really care about domains and ranges and uh, we can just sort of forgive me for passing through that I hope <laughs> uh, and then I'll talk about self-similar inverse semigroups a little bit and say what what changes uh, and then uh, and then I'll say a little bit about how these tilings fit into that framework and uh, and if we get to it, uh, I'll talk about the limit space, and this turns out to be the Anderson-Putnam complex uh, of the tiling space. Um, and you know, it's it's not important that we get there. It's more important that you understand on the way. So please ask questions. Uh, please stop me if there's anything that's confusing. I don't care how far I get. Uh, we'll stop after an hour or however long, whenever you tell me to stop, and we'll be content with that. Right. There's a problem with this document. All right, that's not good news. Uh, okay, should I, I guess I'll stop the share. Uh, we can, not to worry, we'll figure this out. Um, okay, so my only problem is I don't really understand how to work Windows very well. Uh, okay, so is... So how do I get to the USB? Uh, maybe I, maybe I unplug it and then plug it in again, and it just pops up. Okay, there we are. All right. So I guess I want to minimize that. Drag this over here. Okay. Yeah. That worked. All right. Then we open this. Uh, oh yeah, Zoom share screen. Okay, however I get to that. Uh, oh, see how bad I am at Windows. It's kind of amazing. Um, okay, share screen. Open that. Share it. And uh, go full screen mode. Oops, and then drop everything and uh, start again. Okay, uh, are we back? Everyone's okay, good. All right. Uh, so I, I put this up because, I mean, when you visit Melbourne in Australia, you go to the this building because it has a pinwheel tiling on it, and then it happened to even have a, a Tim Burton exhibit, which made me very happy. So uh, I, can't, I can't help but put this in every slide, every talk that I talk about. Anyway, it's uh, so this is a, a famous tiling, the pinwheel tiling, and it's not one of the ones I'm going to talk about today because it has infinite rotations, but uh, it can fit into this framework if you like uh, with some extra modifications. All right, 
So what are tilings? So for me, uh, a tiling starts with a set of proto tiles. And so what is this? This is just a bunch of stacks of tiles, infinite, infinite stacks. Uh, and every tile in my tiling is going to be a translation of one of these guys. So here is a, uh, the Ro Robinson's version of the Penrose tiling. And we have these four tiles and then uh, all tenfold rotations of them. So there's 40 tiles in, in total. And uh, okay, so starting with that, and of course you see that uh, I've colored some differently and that's because I want these to be different tiles. So the pink and the blue tile are different tiles even though they have the same shape and this happens quite a lot. So uh, a tile is for me a, a compact subset of RD with a label such that uh, the tile is a closure of its interior. All right. So uh, I want it to be connected to, but I mean, these are things that you can play with if you like. Um, so can people hear your question or should I repeat it? Okay, so the, it's, it's okay, I can repeat the question. So the question was, it doesn't even need to be connected. Uh, and the answer is no, it doesn't. But for me, uh, I prefer it to be connected and um, we, Okay, so you can relax all these rules in one way or another, but for me at, in this talk, I just wanna stick with the very basic ones. Um, all right, so what's a tiling? Well, it's exactly what you'd expect from somebody coming in and tiling your kitchen or your bathroom. You want all the tiles to be butted against one another. You don't want the tiles to have overlaps, that'd be bad news. And you want to cover everything. So for us, this is the Euclidean plane or R RD. And, this is a formalization of just that. So, but the, the important thing here is that all the tiles here are gonna be translations. So this is the first thing, are translations of your proto tile set. So every tile looks like some translation of one of the proto tiles. And a patch here is a connected finite collection of tiles uh, living in a tiling T. All right. And you can relax that too, but connected here is also makes things simple. Uh, all right, so how do we make tilings? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how to make a tiling, but uh, one, probably the easiest way is to start with the substitution rule. And uh, there's a definition here of how to do that, but the, the really important thing is you inflate and subdivide. So you have all your proto tiles, you take your proto tile and you expand it out to a larger tile, and then you cut it up so it looks like proto tiles again. And if you can do that, then you have a substitution tiling and you can uh, do the following plan. All right, so here's some other properties. And this is one of the problems with tilings is that you're, I'm going to hit you with a million definitions and it's going to be a bit annoying, but, uh, but they all sort of make sense when you start getting into the nuts and bolts. But a tiling is, or a substitution is called primitive if, okay, so for every prototile, if there's some fixed K, so that for all prototiles, after I apply the substitution k times, I see a copy of every other prototile in the image of that substitution. Okay, so if you make a, an adjacency matrix for your substitution, say, this would say that the matrix has no zero entries, it's all positive entries. But uh, we don't need to think about that too much, but that's where the term primitive comes from, for example. Uh, and we always assume that uh, our substitution forces a border, Okay, this is a technical assumption that it doesn't really matter too much what it is, but it stops you from ever tiling like a quarter plane or a half plane, or if you're tiling a line, tiling just half the line. Uh, and what is it? So after I apply the substitution K times for all proto tiles, I should know what tiles border the substituted tiles. Does that make sense? Or should I, do you want a picture of that? Picture? Okay, great. Okay, so the idea is, is it, uh, okay, so I might, uh, you know, do this Penrose tile. Is that big enough? Okay, uh, good. So what, what primitivity says is after I do this enough times, so, you know, maybe I do this again and, okay, this is gonna test my skills here, but something like this. Uh, I know all the tiles that border this in some way or another. Uh, 
So these tiles are just sort of automatically known, all these ones out here. Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, it's called forcing the border if these, these tiles that meet uh, the side of a large enough substitution are known automatically. And this holds for a great deal of tilings. And if it doesn't hold, you can always do this trick called coloring, which I spoke with Tristan about yesterday to force it to force the border. Um, so it's always possible given any substitution is primitive, uh, you can always find a border forcing version of it. Right, okay. All right, so uh, I, I drew the Penrose uh, substitution before actually introducing it, but so here it is. So uh, I have these four tiles and they're all their tenfold rotations. And here's how they subdivide. So nothing too tricky here, but okay. So now I have this substitution. How do I make a tiling out of this? Well, we, you could just sort of imagine that you could just blow up and blow up and blow up and cover the plane, but you can also use uh, sort of this fixed point theory to make this precise. All right, so if I do four substitutions of this red tile or the pink tile, then I see the pink tile sitting in the middle again. And so that means that if I now substitute this again, the pink tile is gonna substitute exactly to this again and all these other tiles are gonna blow up around it. Okay, so I can put the pink tile, the fixed point of the pink, pink tile right in the middle of R2. And then I can just sort of keep substituting and this is gonna blow up in a way that makes it possible to take a union of all these tiles because where they agree, they overlap. Or they, where they overlap, they agree, I guess is a better way to say that. Okay, so for example, this pink tile P is sitting in the fourth substitution of P and the fourth substitution is sitting as a subset in the eighth substitution and so on and so forth. And so because I have this nested sequence of inclusions, I can just take a union and that's what I'm gonna do. And that's automatically a tiling of the plane because of the way I've put the pink tile strongly interior to the, the larger patch. And so it's gonna keep expanding out in every direction in a systematic way. Does that make sense? Good. Okay, and uh, a tiling constructed in this way is called self-similar. Okay, this isn't the self-similar that I'm talking about in this talk, but all right. Uh, so why is it called that? Because if I, the, by construction, if I apply the substitution four times to this tiling, I get the tiling back again. So it's invariant under the substitution or at least the fourth power of the substitution which is nice. Okay, so here's a larger patch of the Penrose tile tiling and uh, okay, good times. All right, so we now, we have a way to construct a tiling now uh, and we want to construct now a space of tiling. So the points in our space are meant to be tilings. Uh, and how do we do that? So we start with the tiling T and then we say, take all possible tilings who's, that are locally indistingu indistinguishable from this original tiling T. So what does this mean? If I take you know, a patch in my tiling T e prime and I, I just look at it somewhere, I can always find this patch in my original tiling T. Okay, there's, this isn't the only way to do it. You can also do it by taking my original tiling T, taking all possible translations, putting a metric on this space, and then completing that metric space uh, under this tiling metric. But you get the same thing at the end of the day, provided you have a set of properties I'm about to tell you about. Okay, so I guess the one, one question you might ask at this point is, what does this set omega look like? And I'm gonna tell you about that. All right, but first I'm gonna to have to tell you the properties that I want to insist on so that I can make this very precise. All right, so first of all, a tiling has fun. If I have a finite set of prototiles, then a tiling has finite low complexity if the number of two tile patches up to translation is finite. So if I look at all the two tile patches, I should just up to translation, I should just see a finite set of two tile different, different patches. So I was talking with Tristan yesterday and he, he immediately came up with the example of what if you take square tiles and then you shear them by one over N at every level. 
this is not going to have finite local complexity because the shear is going to be uh, at a different, um, the number of two tile patches won't be, uh, won't be finite. You look like you didn't quite get that. Do you want me to draw a picture? Yeah, okay, good. All right, yeah, just ask if you have any questions like that. That's a, um, okay, so the, the point was, is that if I go over here, you know, if I first draw my first line of square tiles and I put them uh, in a row like this, and then my second row, I shear it by a half. And in my third row, I shear it by uh, a third. And then I shear it by one over N at every level. This is not gonna have a finite number of different tiles because they're gonna intersect at different, uh, in different ways, all the two tile patches. So this is a, the standard way to construct a non-finite low complexity tiling. So I want to avoid things like that. <clears throat> but if you have a finite number of prototiles, and then you insist that all tiles, maybe say these tiles are all polygons, and then I insist that all the polygons meet full edge to full edge, this is also enough to guarantee your, you have a finite low complexity tiling. A two, the number of two tile patches. Uh, so I just, all I mean is that uh, the the number of tiles where I see one tile and then I put a tile beside it. So the number of patches with just two tiles in it. That's all I mean. Yeah, good question. So here, I mean, this would be a two a perfectly reasonable two tile patch. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, two implies any end. I mean, the official definition of finite little complexity is that, uh, so if I don't have a finite number of prototiles or I don't say that they have to meet full edge to full edge, the official definition of finite little complexity is I take a radius R and I walk around my tiling and I look under the looking glass of my radius R and I should only see a finite number of different configurations of tiles up to translation. So that's how, that's the very general definition of finite low complexity. But if you start with a finite number of prototiles, then it's enough to guarantee to guarantee FLC by looking at the two tile patches. Good. Okay. So a tiling is non periodic. If if I take you know I take my tiling and I take a photocopy of it. So I have two tilings and they, this is an infinite photocopier, which is convenient. Uh, and they match up exactly where I photocopied them, and they should not match up if I slide any other way. They shouldn't match up ever again. So formally, if I take t plus x equals t, so I translate t by some vector x, then x has to be the zero vector. And uh, a tiling is, oh, no, no, these are great questions. Yeah, so you so you can shear if you if you don't insist that they meet up full edge to full edge, then you can just shear by one over one over n or one over two to the n at every level. Exactly, and then they meet in a yeah yeah yeah. It's a it's a great question because it's a I mean it's the question that you you should always be thinking of is how how does this fail and yeah exactly exactly okay so and a tiling t is called strongly non periodic if uh, the the hull or the tiling space omega contains no periodic tilings. So that can also fail and I'll leave it as a maybe, if you, if you haven't figured it out, if you wanna think about that for the rest of the talk, that's fine. But if you haven't figured it out by the end of the talk, I will, I will answer how you do that. But don't think too hard about it. Okay, and finally, a tiling T is repetitive if for a fixed small r, I look at all the patches that intersect a small r radius. So, and then I ask that there's a big radius so that when I take that big radius, I see all those patches of small r radius within that big radius in any tiling. And Tristan called me up on, a, on some nonsense that it, we put in this paper that uh, we said, we had a different version of repetitivity that assumed finite low complexity. And then we said, uh, so these are equivalent. To, this is just for Tristan, sorry. 
I'm talking to him privately right now. Uh, the, uh, if you start with finite little complexity, the other version of repetitivity uh, is equivalent to this one. But then we said, of course, all repetitive tilings are finite little complexity, which was nonsense. Uh, so this is the real version of repetitivity that we should have been using. And this is the version that's used in the literature. And people start taking for granted finite little complexity. And, uh, yeah, you know how this goes. Anyway, uh, so if you're Radden and Wolf, you're very happy because you probably have the easiest theorem to prove named after you. Um, you can, I, I ask my third year honor students to prove this theorem all the time and they all do it. So T has finite little complexity if and only if this uh, tiling space is a compact metric space. And so what do you do? You just look at Cauchy sequences of tilings and they, they, first of all, you prove that a Cauchy sequence of tilings has to converge to a tiling. And then you prove that, uh, that any subsequence uh, or any sequence has a convergent subsequence. And, it's very, it's actually very easy, very nice. But uh, nonetheless, they were the first to prove it. So it's very nice. Uh, and of course, as analysts, uh, we like such things, right? We, compactness is uh, something that we can, you know, make good use of. So do you also have a structural and substitution? Uh, so, so all you need for this particular result is uh, finite low complexity. Uh, so no, so that's that's only for substitution tilings. So I'm I'm and the self similarity that we put that I put earlier when I constructed that tiling, and there I mean there's other ways to construct tilings, and the self similarity that I'm going to talk about today is for substitution tilings. So there's another way that you can make tilings called cut and project. And uh, that's that doesn't give you this self-similar scheme. You can also uh, construct tilings by local matching rules. And that also doesn't necessarily have a self-similar structure. So that's, that's something that uh, comes from the substitution. Good. Oh, yeah, yeah. So can I say how it's constructed? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, so how, so you take your tiling and you take all possible translations of it. So this is gonna be your tiling space at the moment, um, or you can start with the tiling space if you like. So the two tilings are close if they match on a large ball around the origin. So the tiles are exactly the same on a large ball around the origin up to a small wiggle. So the small wiggle means up to vectors of radius less than epsilon. I can shift my tiling so that they match exactly on a ball of radius one over epsilon. So it's essentially the big ball metric from dynamical systems or the, I mean, this is really the product metric, right? Except that you allow this little shift. Well, yeah, but you take the same one. That's right. You just take epsilon for both. And then you take the least such epsilon for this to apply. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And that's, a, I mean, it's complicated to write down because match on a large ball up to a small wiggle is annoying. But, uh, but it, it's really, the idea of it's very simple. It's really that they, it's really the product topology. So you want them to match around the origin up to a small wiggle. Okay, good. Okay, so we want to now discretize things because, uh, okay, so if you're Kellen Donk and, and me also, uh, you want to make a Caesar algebra out of these things and you want, so to do that, you want to make a groupoid and you'd like that groupoid to be a tau. Now, I'm not going to say too much about that, but it turns out that this is important also for the construction of a semi-group that I'm going to show you today. So how do you discretize things? Well, you take an abstract transversal to this tiling space. How do you do that? So for every prototile, we put a puncture in the prototile. So you just pick, you have this, these stacks of tile. You just pick a point that's similar in each tile. And, uh, and then what do you do? Well, you extend, remember a tiling is just translations of these prototiles. So you can extend the punctures to every tile in your tiling by just 
extending the punctures out in the same way. So that's what this X. So X of T is a puncture of a tile T. And then X or X of P is a puncture of the protile. And then X of T is a puncture of the tile. And you just extend it out in the same way you do to make a tiling. And then you, uh, then you take a subset of this continuous hull or tiling space. So what do we do? We say, we take the subset where uh, we look at all possible tilings in a tiling space where the origin is exactly matching with one of the punctures of our tile. Okay, so that's, uh, so omega punk or the punctured hull or the discrete hull you'll hear, hear, you'll hear it talked about. And it turns out if you care about such things that this is an abstract transversal for the tiling space. Okay, and here is the Penrose tiling. So here I'm imagining the, you know, the origin going through this pink tile and it turns out that the, that the origin is exactly on the puncture of this pink tile. And hence, this is in the tiling space. And of course, I can't draw an infinite tiling, so you're meant to imagine it's going out in every direction. Okay, so I said we talked about the tiling metric, um, but it turns out that this, uh, this punctured hull has an even nicer neighbor neighborhood base uh, than the tiling metric. And what is that? So what do I do? I pick some finite patch P, and then I take a tile from my finite patch P and I say that UPT is the clopen subset or, uh, or just open subset of all tilings T in the punctured hull. So that if I translate the origin to be exactly on the puncture of the tile T in my patch, that this tiling extends that patch outwards. Okay, so I'm, I'm fixing a tile, a tile T with a with a patch around it and then i'm saying all tilings t that extend that patch are part of this open subset upt okay and here's the exact same picture from the last slide but now i'm thinking of this as the patch this as my tile t and then all tilings that extend this patch outwards belong to the set upt for this particular guy Everyone happy? Enough? Okay, and Kellendonk proved in his original paper about these, this punctured hull that these are clopen subsets and, uh, and hence this, can this space or the discrete hull, omega punk is a cantor set, rather nice. And okay, if you're an analyst, you like compact, but you like cantor sets even better, at least if you're me. Okay, so, <laughs> so now uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the, how we, this is the start of the setup for creating this into a, a self-similar space, a self-similar semi-group. Okay, so the first thing is we wanna talk about super tile extensions. So what are those? So if I look at a prototype P and then I substitute it, I can consider all the tiles in the substituted version. So for example, here, you know, I have this prototype P here, and then I have two tiles T1 and T2 uh, in the substituted version. Okay, and uh, it turns out that, okay, so don't, don't worry too much about the second statement. You can, if you don't have labels on your tiles, then you can always consider this as uh, a subset of the prototype squared because each of these are some translation of a prototype. But it might be that you have multiple different versions of the same prototile in a, in a tiling, in which case you would have to be a bit more careful. Okay, and a super tile extension is, what is it? So it's a pair. So in this case, it's gonna be uh, T1 and P and T2 and P. So these are the two super tile extensions from this particular picture here. Okay, so what is it? It's a, it's a pairing uh, so that, um, you know, we have, we just record which tiles T sit in the substitutions of P and we make one pairing for each one of those guys. And uh, of course we, because I'm, you know, I have a system here where 
I'm think I'm going to think of this as an edge in some graph soon. So I may as well make a range and a and a source map on this. So the range of this E is uh, the T, and the source of this E is the P. Okay, and once I have a range and a source, I can make a graph by just saying that you know the range and source have to match up if I'm going to follow an edge around. So, um, yeah. I think I'm pretty much ready for an example. How about you guys? Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe not. I <laughs> uh, thought it was coming now, but okay. So anyway, once we have a substitution graph, we can make a topological Markov shift. And uh, how do you do that? You just take all possible uh, sequences of edges so that they their their paths in the graph. So this is E0, E1, E2, such as source of EI equals a range of EI plus one. And there's a shift map on this. And of course, there's a natural topology on this. Is, this is just the, the metric where two sequences are close if they match up on a, on a first uh, end terms, say. OK, and this is a claim that I will say something. I'll say a little bit more about with the uh, example, but I, I'm not going to prove it here. But this topological Markov shift is uh, is is dynamically conjugate or conjugate to the punctured hull. And I'll try and say a little bit more about that with an example. So. Yeah, so the substitution exactly is a homeomorphism on the punctured hull. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, now we get to an example. Apologies for getting you all excited and then giving you another page of jargon. All right, so here is, uh, okay, so this doesn't look exactly like the Fibonacci tiling, but this is a border forcing version of the Fibonacci tiling. Yeah, that's right. So you extend it to the tile. Yeah, so the substitution is defined only on prototiles and then it extends to tiles by extending it in the same way as it extends on prototiles. Yeah, that, I mean, you have to be careful about that when you're writing papers, of course, but in a talk, I can sort of just, yeah. Okay, so you can trust me that this is something to do with the Fibonacci tiling. So here are the four tiles, A, B, C, and D, and they substitute uh, like so. Okay, and then, so what do I get? I have all these, uh, all these super tile extensions. So let's look at one. So here's this, this from B, from tile B to tile A, there's a super tile extension AB. So where does that come from? That says that in tile, prototile B, I see a copy of A. So let's check that. So in the substitution of B, I see A. Sorry? The A, B, C, D are the colors. Yeah, yeah. These are the labels. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, exactly. Okay. And, uh, and of course, now I have this graph, so I can just uh, take a walk through the graph if I want. And this gives me a Markov uh, shift. And the claim is that this it has something to do with a tiling in a punctured hull. So let's see that. All right. Here's how it works. <laughs> this is a this is a, maybe one of the more confusing slides, so we can just make sure everyone's happy with it. All right. So here I have prototile B sitting in uh, the substitution of D, and then D sitting in B and B and D and so on. So how do we read this? All right. So first of all, I'm going to start with tile B that's sitting at the bottom, and uh, D is sitting above it. So D substitutes to B. All right. And then above D, D comes from a substitution of B. And B comes from a substitution of, of D. Okay. So what information do I glean from this just ex right away? So first of all, when I substitute B, I get A and D. And so I start filling in the areas around this, this tile B at the bottom with CD. But then also we have this border forcing property. 
And so the border forcing property tells us that certain tiles always sit. So B always has a D in front of it. And you can prove that. You're going to have to take my word for it. And B also, and D up there also has, always has a tile behind it. And this turns into A, D. And so you get these dash lines that are coming from the border forcing property that start allowing you to fill out more and more around your original tile B. And in this way, if I look at a, a sequence like this, it's gonna fill out not just B and the tiles around it, but uh, an entire tiling of the line. Does that make sense? So this is how we go from uh, a sequence in a topological Markov shift coming from a substitution, coming from super tile extensions to a tiling of the line. And if we do this, and in the opposite way, we can start with a, start out with a tiling. Okay, you need to have the, a property called recognizability, but you can always then identify which substitutions come from which, and uh, in such a way you can go to a topological Markov shift. So this is so that's proving that these two spaces are homeomorphic, and then you just have to check that their dynamics do the same thing. Everyone happy with that? Great. Okay. I did a bad job of explaining this the last time I gave a similar talk, so I was a bit nervous about this. All right, so now I wanna stop doing that for a second and just talk about self-similar groups and, and what a self-similar group is. And then, we're, and then we'll try and translate that to, uh, to um, the system we're interested in. And I threw up a, a few references here. Because uh, it's, you know, this is, if you're going to look at self-similar groups, the most famous self-similar group is Grigorchuk's group. Uh, and the reason is that it answered uh, two really interesting problems when it was first developed. And then uh, people like Grigorchuk, Nekrashevich, Bartholdi uh, looked at uh, self-similar groups more generally than the Grigorchuk group and started an entire uh, new area of group theory or geometric group theory. It's been extended in many, many ways. And I saw Enrique is in the crowd up on Zoom. And he, so he was one of the people that extended self-similar groups to graphs. So you don't have to just act on, a, on an alphabet, you can act on a graph and so on and so forth. Okay, how does this work? Let's see. So I'm gonna start out with a, a finite set X. Uh, and I'm gonna let X to the N be the set of words of length N in that alphabet. So you take all possible words of length n. Okay, and then x star is gonna be the union of all possible length n words for any n. So I'm just looking at all possible finite words in my alphabet x. Okay, and suppose you have a group acting faithfully on this, uh, this set x star. Everyone happy with the word faithful? Write it down. So if, okay, so, if you have two group elements that act the same on every possible finite word, then faithfulness implies that those two group elements are equal. So that's, that's how faithfulness comes in. There's other ways to phrase it, but that's the most useful way in my mind. Uh, okay, so you have this group acting faithfully on X star, then we say it's self-similar. If for every group element G and, uh, and letter X in my finite set X, there exists some new group element H such that if I, if I want to read how G acts on a word XW, then I can first read how G acts on X, that's well-defined, and then I get this new group element acting on, on W, and that new element acts on all possible Ws that follow X. So this, this relation holds for all possible Ws, and hence this H depends only on G and X. So I can view this as, I mean, the way, the correct way to view this is groups generated by automaton. So how does the group read a, a string? It first looks at the first letter and it acts on it. And then it gives you a new group element acting on the rest of the string. And then it acts on the first letter of that and gives you a new group element acting on the rest of the string. And it just goes along acting and changing the string to a new word. Sorry? So here it's length preserving. It doesn't need to be. That's, that's something you can loosen, but 
Yes, 100%. So the, the here, because of the way I've defined it, how G acts on X and gives you a new, so yeah. So this, okay. So this is supposed to be just a length one word. Yeah. So I didn't say that here, but you're right. So it, it's length preserving. Yep. Okay. And faithfulness of the action implies this group element H is unique. Is unique and it only depends on G and X. So we're gonna use a new symbol, this G restricted to X, and we're gonna define that to be uh, this unique group element H. Okay, and we call this a restriction of G to X, and hence we can just rewrite this self-similar relation by G acting on XW is G dot X and G restricted to X acting on W, and that holds for all possible W. Now, I'm giving you a very fast tour of self-similar groups, so I'm just gonna give you a couple examples. There's so much to say here, of course, and I'm kind of shoving it all under the carpet, but let me just give you a couple examples to whet your appetite. So the first one is the odometer. So let's let our finite set be just a set zero one. And then I'm gonna define uh, an element A, and I'm just gonna tell you how it acts on the length one words and how it restricts. And then remember that these are just uh, acting by automaton. So I can tell you, so from this information, you can see how it acts on all finite words. Okay, so a dot zero is one, a dot one is zero. And then the restriction of a to zero is the identity or neutral element. And uh, a restricted to one is a again. Okay, and this extends to finite words by the self-similar relation. And the self-similar group generated by a, so, in order to make it faithful, I, I want to think of it as a subgroup of the automorphism group on X star um, is the integers. Okay, and it's co commonly called the odometer because it's just acting by adding one with carryover. That's exactly what we've done. And let's just see an example of this. So here a squared denotes to the integer two. And I just, I just see how it acts. So first A turns a zero into a one, and then I get the neutral element acting on the rest of the string. And now I use this A and I, the one turns into a zero. And then I get A again acting on the rest of the string. And here, what does it do? So this one zero, A acting on one is zero, restricted to, restricted is A again, acting on one is zero. And then it turns a zero into a one. And you can just sort of carry through this computation to see that it's adding one with carryover. Okay, so this is the odometer, um, very standard dynamics example. So it's probably the most famous example of a Cantor minimal dynamical system. Okay, the second one is the Grigorchuk group. And okay, so here's, four automorphisms thought as a subgroup of uh, the automorphism group of X acting in this following way. And here I've kind of taken the liberty to write the restrictions in this way. So, you know, A acting on X is Y and then it restricts to the neutral element is, so this is just a new set of notations. I should have not done this, but anyway, I seem to have done it. Uh, but, and then B acting on X is X, B restricted to X is A. That's how you read that. Okay, and if you take these uh, four elements, then you can prove some things. And this is what Grigorchuk did. So first of all, all these generators have order two. So A squared is the neutral element. B squared is the neutral element, C squared. They all have order two, already interesting. And then they satisfy some relations. So if I take CD, that's B, and that's the same as DC. So they have all these relations that are going on as elements of the auto subgroup, as elements of the subgroup of the automorphism group of X, or as, if you like, as a faithful action on the finite words. So remember, we say two things are equal if they act the same on all finite words, and that's how you do this. You prove that A squared is, the, it looks like the identity on all finite words, and then that implies that A squared is the identity. Okay, so it has these relations that, uh, that are rather interesting. And in particular, you can prove that actually this is an infinite group 
and every element is a torsion element. So every element, there's some power of it, so that that power is a neutral element. And this uh, is called a Burnside group. Um, and it was a question of Burnside whether infinite uh, torsion groups exist. And it turns out they do. This wasn't the first example, but it was very close to the first. I think it was a third. And it's by far the easiest to write down. I mean, I just wrote down the, the definition on, on a slide and then you can just go ahead and use that definition to prove this. More importantly, it answered a question of Milner from 1968. And this was the first group that was ever uh, exhibited to have intermediate growth. So what does this mean? You're looking at, so you look at, as I go from words in the group, of length n to length n plus one, you can ask what the growth is from length n to length n plus one. So how many more words of length n plus one are there than length n words? And it turns out that that's not linear in this example, and it's not exponential. And so it's said to have in intermediate growth, and this was the first example of such a group. It also, all groups with intermediate growth uh, are amenable. And you can prove that this is not elementary amenable if you care what that is. And so this was the first example, as far as I know, of a group that is amenable, but not elementary amenable. So it answered a lot of questions just straight away. And this was really uh, the sort of power of this group. So Grigorcha came along, found this group, and then he started proving these beautiful things about it. And it's defined in such a lovely way. It's just a, a group of uh, an automaton. And uh, this is why self slimmer groups became such a big deal. Okay. So now I'm going to go to inverse semigroup actions. So let's check the time. Oof. So do I have till five? Is that all right? No, uh, I should be done by five. It's uh, uh, Okay. So a semigroup S is an inverse semigroup if uh, for each element of S, uh, there's a unique element, S star. Um, and it has this relation like partial isometries in a C star algebra. So uh, S, S star, S is equal to S and S star, S, S star is equal to S star. Okay, and uh, the Wegener uh, Preston representation theorem. So this was, one of them was from the UK and one from Russia. And they apparently developed this theory at the same time. And then they realized it after the Iron Curtain came down. And uh, so it's named after both of them. Um, it, so it essentially says that every inverse semigroup is uh, isomorphic to a sub semigroup of the partial bijections on a set X. So if you ever see anything acting by partial bijections on some set, there's an inverse semigroup sitting around and, and it's typically interesting. Okay, and then an action of an inverse semigroup is just extending the idea of an action of a group. So uh, it's, a homo it's a homomorphism pi from your semigroup S into the set of partial bijections on a set X. Uh, and then, you know, we just fix the homomorphism and we write G dot X instead of this pi G's of X. So in the same way, we had this action of a group where we're thinking of now an action of a semigroup. But of course, an action of a semigroup, you have domains and ranges that you have to care for. And by partial bijection, you mean bijection Yeah, exactly. So I mean a partial isometry, really. I mean, uh, so yeah, yep. I guess there's no isometry, but yeah, exactly. Yep. Okay, so the tiling inverse semigroup. So this was done by Kellendonk very early on, like 96 or something. Um, so he essentially was looking for C star algebras and making groupoid C star algebras. And so we had this UPT set, which was the clopin subsets of our tiling. And then remember on our tiling, we have this translation action. Okay, so how do you incorporate the translation action into a groupoid? Well, you just make a groupoid of translations. And then we wonder about the topology of this. And you naturally just come up with this doubly pointed patch idea. So what is it? So here we take a, a patch P and we take two tiles within that patch, A and B. And we say up to translation, 
we're going to have, we're going to just make an equivalence on these patches and spe specify tiles so that up to translation are equal. And, uh, and okay, so what are the, what's the set? Uh, script T is a set of all possible double, doubly pointed patch patches along with a zero element. So for all possible patches P and all possible tiles A and B in it, I just take, I take the equivalence of translation, so they're equal if they're translated to one another, and then I just look at this giant set all together. All right, so why, does it, why is that important? Well, if I take two doubly pointed patches, um, you know, have, so after I translate, if, the, if I can make it so the puncture of B matches with the puncture of C, and if, the patches P and Q, once I've identified these, agree where they intersect, then I can multiply them. And how do I multiply them? So I multiply them by uh, taking the union of the patches and then I just erase the two middle things just like you do in Drupaloids all the time. You're probably very used to this. And otherwise you just set it to be equal to zero. So this is where the zero element comes in. Okay, and it turns out this is a semigroup. It's an inverse semigroup, in fact. Uh, and so we call this the tiling semigroup. And to make connections with CSR algebras, these, these such sets are the clopin subsets of your translation groupoid. And once you have a, a, a discrete groupoid with a topology, then you can start completing to make CSR algebras. And this is exactly what Kellen Dunk did to make the, the tiling CSR algebra. Okay. All right. And of course we see that this naturally acts by partial bijections. So how does this work? So I have this discrete hull. All right. And then I have a doubly pointed patch G and the domain is going to be all tilings that have patch P centered at A. Uh, at the origin and codomain all patches P centered at B. So what am I doing? I'm translating within this patch from tile A to tile B. And that's the action of translation uh, of this doubly pointed patch on a tiling T. That makes sense. Or should I draw a picture of that too? Maybe I have a picture, but let's see. No, I'll leave this up and I'll draw a picture. All right, so we have, uh, Right, so we have some patch P, and then we have uh, a tile, uh, what, what do I want, A in it, and a tile uh, B. Okay, and each of these tiles have a puncture somewhere. Okay, so what is, what are we doing? So this, so first of all, we're looking at all tilings T, I missed that by a mile. All tiles T that are centered at tile A and then extend this patch. Okay, and that moves to, so that's a domain and the codomain is all tilings T that are, that are translates of this T prime with tile B and P centered at the origin. So what does this do? It just translates it looks at all tilings T that are tr that translate to T prime with B at the origin. And that's the action of this semigroup element on a tiling space. Okay, and again here, I mean, this is just some, some stuff, but I've just, we've set this all up so that this, uh, the action agrees with function composition. And that's why we have these arrows going backwards. Okay. So here's the definition uh, of uh, self similar inverse semigroup. This is due to Bartholdi, Grigorczyk, and Nektrushevich from some, uh, some lecture notes in Graz. Uh, but it doesn't really matter that much. So you don't have to read this. It's the exact same as a group case, except that you have to care for domains and ranges. That's the whole game here. And because we have partial bijections instead of full bijections. We just have to make sure that when we, when we say things, we're, they make sense. And so don't even bother reading this. It's just uh, the, 
the everything is all just making sure that we care about that. Okay, and Jamie and I managed to prove that uh, the tiling semigroup of a substitution tiling defined the self-similar inverse semigroup action on this topological Markov shift. And I'm going to, I think, end with uh, an example of how this goes. And so this is the second most confusing slide, but we've already dealt with the with this the underlay of it, right? So here we have the exact same thing. So I have this BD, DB, BD. And so what is that? That says B, and then that comes from a D, that comes from a B, and then you get all this other stuff for free, but by the border forcing property and how the substitution works. Yeah, yeah. So it's a so this one is coming from this Fibonacci example. So we had this Fibonacci tiling with A, B, C, D, and then we had this substitution graph on on it coming from the super tile extensions. And this so these are just edges in that substitution graph. Is that the question? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Good. All right. So this is the particular one for this Fibonacci example. All right, and now what do I have? I have a, so it turns out that because we have finite little complexity, everything comes from a two tile patch. So be, the semi-group allows us to glue together these two tile patches if they agree. So I can come up with any connected patch by gluing together two tile patches. So all I have to do is tell you how the two tile patches operate on this level. Okay, so here's the two tile patch. P sub BA, so what do I mean? I mean this two tile patch here, B, B followed by an A. And everywhere there's a B followed by an A, this guy can operate. Okay, good. So how do I, how do I act on uh, this string? Well, this, what does it do? Remember this, this element shifts me from B to A. So it goes from B to A. So I did it backwards to the way I did it there, but okay. So it goes from B to A. And so now I have to figure out, so remember this string was, was a B coming from a D. And now I just look up and I say, I, I look at this A, where does the A come from? Well, the A comes from the C. So that shifts this BD to an AC after translating. Okay, so I have this AC and then I, and then I wonder what's the new semigroup element that's going to do this shift here to move me from this D to the C where I need to be. And of course, it's just a two tile patch DC and it has domain D and range C. So you just, it's very easy. You just follow the, where things come from and where they go. Okay, and similarly, now I have this, this D going to a C. So now I have this, I'm operating now on the DB. And what do I do? I move this over. And then I wonder where this, where this C came from. This C came from an A. And so the second DB turns into uh, a CA. And then I look up again and I see where it came from. And the trick is, is that as long as, so these little daggers here are representing super tile boundaries. So that's just the boundaries of the substitution at the previous level. If I don't cross one of these super tile boundaries, then I get nothing in my restriction. I get the, the neutral element. And okay, I didn't do an example of that, but uh, uh, if, if, for example, instead of this direction, I went this direction, then up here, I would look where this, uh, where, where this came from, and it came from an A, but I don't cross a super tile boundary here. So the restriction would be zero or the neutral, the, z the zero element of the semi-group. So, it would just act the same, if that makes sense. But that's how it works. And, uh, I, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's all just chasing definitions around and making sure everything works out. And, but it's very complicated because you have these, uh, all these different structures in play and you have to make sure that everything works together nicely. Okay, and uh, I'm gonna end here, but I have another example. Um, of a, of a two-dimensional tiling, uh, I'll, I'll send the slides through. So if you wanna have a look at these, you can have a look at them. And then we also managed in this paper to prove that if you take something called the, the asymptotic equivalence relation 
on a self-similar group or a self-similar inverse semigroup that you recover what's called the Anderson Putnam complex of the tiling space and so on and so forth. So everything matches up nicely. And with that, I'll thank you very much for coming and paying attention. <laughs>I do notice that they're all one-dimensional, two-dimensional examples. Are there are there interesting three-dimensional tilings? Of yeah, yeah, there of course. Uh, I mean, I can't draw pictures of them, but yeah, there's there's yeah. So Lego, the uh, yeah, okay, good. No, I should just bring some Lego. Yeah. So there's lots of really interesting three-dimensional tilings, and but it's really the the one and two-dimensional ones are the ones that are the most studied for sure because we can draw pictures of them. And then there's uh, sort of three-dimensional tilings, of course, interesting. And this is, you know, people don't study higher than that, really. Um, of course, we state all results for RD whenever we can. But there's a, you know, once you, uh, I guess there's, I mean, I could say this. So there's something called the gap labeling problem. And uh, this uh, get, gets into some hot water once you go above three dimensions because of the churn character and things like this. So that's, that this is extra information. I probably shouldn't volunteer, but anyway. That's, that's... Any other questions? Luckily, there's lots of questions during the talk, so. Oh. <laughs> uh, this is just trying to make something look like things I understand. The, the, what was it, the self-similar group? You had this, yeah, you had a product and then you were applying on the first and then it was dictating an element in the second and dictating an element in the third. It looks to me something like a braided op algebra product in some well, sense. Uh, I don't know. No, okay. I think you would probably know better than I do. It's a, it, it could be, I mean, it's, it's, it's always interesting the connections that sort of come. I don't know if there's a co-product uh, that comes naturally That's from this. Yeah, that's that's. I, initially, I thought there was some sort of a co-product going on, but then when you say that it's dictated by this, it would, yeah. Yeah, you know. there's something to that. I mean, so you can make a Zappachet product from a self-similar group action, and this is really you can think of this as a group acting on the space, but in the opposite way, you can think of it as a space acting on the group, and so that has some sort of flavor of a co-product in yeah. some way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, question since you didn't really mention Caesar algebras what could you say about the Caesar algebras of these guys yeah that's a good question um so they can be built yeah so uh so Kalendonk studied he introduced these Caesar algebras uh back in 96 or so and I mean they're really nice examples of Caesar algebras because you can sort of see what where the relations come from so for example I spent some time studying the pinwheel tiling with this uh rotations in it and you can see this rotation is, as commutation relations in your Caesar algebra, which is very nice. Um, so these tilings have uh, Caesar algebras associated with them. And it turns out that up to dimension three, the, the, the K theory of these Caesar algebras is understood very well by using the churn character and the Cantal isomorphism to relate it to the cohomology of the tiling space. So how do you make the cohomology of this tiling space? Well, you just think of this as a simplex. So you have all these prototiles and you think of them as simplices where if two tiles ever agree in a tiling, this is how you make the Anderson Putnam complex, by the way. If two tiles ever meet in a tiling, you identify their edges and you get this uh, finite two, well, okay, in the two dimensional case, you get this finite two simplex and you have this identification on edges, on vertices, uh, and then you have faces, and you can just take the cohomology of the simplex, uh, and then you get some uh, some check cohomology uh, group, and then it turns out that actually these so these check cohomology behaves very nicely under inverse limits, 
and tiling spaces are made up by inverse limits. So how do you make a tiling into an inverse limit? First, I want to know what's at the origin, and then I want to know what patches around that, and then I want to know what patches around that. And this is an inverse limit. And so then you can just take these finite uh, cohomology things and take the inverse limit turns into a direct limit for cohomology and you just compute it and you get uh, the K theory, which is very nice. Um, so quite a lot is known, I guess. Uh, we know how to compute the K theory up to dimension three. We know uh, what the algebras look like. So they're all, if you add these conditions of, so what is it? So a periodicity is free, um, repetitive is minimal. And so you get simple Caesar algebras uh, and so on and so forth. They have AF cores in them and for substitution tiling. So a substitution gives you a Bradley diagram and then you can under try to understand what the AF algebra is from this di diagram. Okay, maybe I'm saying more than I, than I should, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so we know quite a lot and it's, it's really fun to play around with them. They give really nice examples of Caesar algebras. Yeah, 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 so the, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Any other questions either here or online? I don't know if I can see everyone. Okay, if I, not, oh uh, yeah, go ahead, please. Said, I think, go ahead. Okay, I guess that was not really a question. So we will just thank uh, Mike again. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Uh -huh.